Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our seminar this afternoon. Uh, we are running, we're running a little bit late, um, but we do have several people logged in to watch it uh, via webinar, so we're gonna try our best to keep on schedule. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is Susan Tai, and I'm a professor here at the University of Waterloo, I'm also the director of the Center for Payment and Transportation Technology, and the Norman McLeod uh, Professor. And uh, we're very pleased on behalf of the Norman McLeod Professorship and as well uh, CPAT to be hosting this seminar today. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome our colleague, Dr. Tenz Henning, who is visiting from the University of Auckland. He is a leading expert in performance-based contracts. And so today he's gonna be giving us a seminar on, on his experience with performance-based contracts. And so without further ado, I would like to welcome him um, to the podium. And after uh, the presentation, we'll have time for questions. And for those of you who are um, via uh, webinar, please send your questions um, via email to me, and I will be monitoring them. Uh, my address is sl. T-I-G-H-E at uwaterloo.ca. Okay, so thank you. Please join me in welcoming Tens. Thank you very much, Professor Tai. It's an uh, honor to be here today. I know there's uh, quite a few uh, people from the ministry here with us from the University of Waterloo. Um, I've got two of my own students here who's uh, visiting this part of the world. Um, also on the webinar, I know that there's somebody down south as far as North Carolina, and I think we've got people from uh, Calgary and Vancouver also linked in, so thank you very much. Um, I will be talking about performance measures today, um, and I'm gonna talk about it in a broad sense, covering not only performance-based contracts, but I will also be talking about performance monitoring and management, and also in relation to uh, pavement management systems. Um, the presentation is based on work that I have been involved with, with two of my colleagues, Dr. Joseph uh, Costello. He's also at the University of Auckland, and then uh, also Professor Susan Tai, um, that uh, was very kind often in peer reviewing our reports, research reports out of New Zealand, and I'm currently involved in a joint project for the MOT uh, in this field with Susan, so thank you again. Um, I appreciate that. I've seen a few faces. It's been at the conference in Miami a few weeks back. Um, I have covered a similar presentation in Miami, but um, I'm gonna make it your worthwhile to attend this one. Uh, because I'll cover the theoretical bit um, in a few slides and we will probably uh, run through those. And then at the end, I will show you a little bit of a case study where we've had uh, used um, some of the new techniques in performance management and measures to understand the behavior of networks. Uh, first of all, this is the world I come from. Um, is, can we switch off that spotlight, perhaps? Yes, that's much better, thank you. Um, not a very clear picture, but this is the Hobbits movie, as uh, some of you may have seen. It's definitely not me. Um, <laughs> also, I haven't seen a Hobbit yet. There's not many people with hairy feet in New Zealand, so, um, uh, but certainly the movie was uh, shot in, must be some of the most spectacular parts of New Zealand. And, and I encourage you to go and have a look at these movies, even though you may only go for the scenic part of the movies. So uh, just a little bit of context. So we've got the world map up here. There's, uh, we are on about there somewhere. New Zealand is all the way down in the Pacific, as far south as you can go. You will note there's what we like to call the West Island of New Zealand. Um, <laughs> And, and, and there's two mistakes that you don't do is uh, you don't call Canadian uh, American or American Canadian. Also, you don't call Australian New Zealander and New Zealander Australia, so uh, be very careful of that one. Um, 
To give you a better feel, it's about eight to ten movies distance from flying from Toronto to uh, New Zealand. And uh, yeah, but it's certainly worthwhile. We've got two islands, the North Island and the South Island. Um, on the South Island, the main centre being Christchurch, where the earthquake was a couple of years back. I'm from Auckland, so it's way up the north in the uh, North Island. A little bit about the road network, almost 100,000 kilometres of roads, of which uh, 60,000 is sealed. We've got 75,000 of that in the rural areas. Um, so you can see it's predominantly a, a, a rural network. By the way, there's about 4 million people in New Zealand of which 1.4 million lives in Auckland. So there's not a lot of people living in the rest of the country, but extensive road network, um, mainly to serve the farming community um, in New Zealand. Road funds, the state highways, um, is 100% funded through the road fund, which come from petrol taxes and vehicle licensing taxes and all those sort of things. Local roads would be centrally funded 40 to 60%, depending on the size of the local authority, whether it's a city or a district council, and the remaining part of the um, funding would come from the local ratepayers. So that's a little bit of a, a scene setting in New Zealand. Um, some typical shots of roads that you will see if you travel the country, and by the way, that is most probably most of our traffic, um, also most of our food. <laughs> so now we've got about uh, varying between uh, 40 million to 70 million sheep in New Zealand, uh, depending on the season. So um, you do have quite a bit of New Zealand um, lamb available in your supermarkets, I saw. Uh, best barbecue meat, by the way. Um, the rest of the network, rural, uh, quite winding topography. Uh, most of our pavements would be uh, thin, flexible pavements constructed with natural materials. Sometimes it will, would be stabilized. And then around 70 to 80 percent of our surfacing will be thin chip seal or spray seal surfaces. Um, so we do have uh, quite a vulnerable network in terms of the climate. Uh, when it gets wet, it blows out pretty fast. So um, you may wonder why asset management is as advanced as it is coming from New Zealand. Well, basically, uh, we cannot afford building more resilient roads. Um, therefore, we have to look after what we have uh, very carefully and, 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 and fix them when they need to be fixing. Otherwise, uh, those roads will go into a rapid uh, failure mode and cost a lot to repair. So that's a little bit about the network. Um, which is quite important to keep in mind when I go through the presentation today. There are many of the things and trends in performance management that I will be referring to that may not be directly applicable uh, to this part of the world, yet there are principles that you can uh, certainly have a look at. So my core message today, starting off with uh, uh, the data uh, topic, and, and really there is no way that you can do performance management of whatever sort if you, if you don't have confidence in your data. And I'll spend a bit of time on that. Also with uh, performance management to link that to an organization's objectives and goals. It seems like a very simple, straightforward one, but it's um, often interesting for me when you do an implementation of a performance-based contract or a performance monitoring system and you ask the asset owner, so uh, tell me about your network. And they may be able to explain the latest trends on the network. And you ask them, so what do you want? How do you want your network to look in five or 10 years from now? What would you like to improve? What needs to change? And certainly if you can answer those questions, the performance management or the contracting is actually an easier um, task to set up. But that's crucial to really focus it on the objectives and the goals. Through performance management, um, in whatever form you use it, you've got to be able to tell a simple story. I think as engineers, we've, we've got two problems in performance management. The first one is we would like to report on everything that we can measure. 
And believe me, we can measure a lot of things, right? But it doesn't necessarily tell us a story one we want to know. So it's really um, is, 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 is tell the story through effective measures. And only so much that you need, as little as possible, and no more. Then the last point there, um, I don't want to use the S word today too much because that normally turns off engineers, but really you need a basic, basic understanding of statistics and how networks statistically changes over time in order to be effective in this area. Um, um, some of the things that will come out today is uh, heartland lessons. Um, I've heard somebody said that uh, I learned so much through my mistakes. I think I'm going to make a few more today. And, and that's pretty much the story that I'm telling you today is everything that we've discovered came through trying things that didn't work and we have had to find a, a solution for the situation. Just a little bit of definitions. I know that performance measures one of those terms in our area that's been used very wildly. Uh, not my definitions, but certainly in terms of the presentation for your background to know uh, what I'm referring to when I do use these terms. So the first one is we just look at some sort of a condition distribution of a network. And, and the first thing for you to note there, I didn't draw the old classical bell shape. It's a highly skewed distribution. I challenge you to go out on your networks, look at your ages of your network, look at your condition, you will find very few being actually normally distributed, which has an impact on how you report on it. In my class, those who's been to my um, infrastructure management classes know that I say average is a swear word in infrastructure management. So just be careful for using averages. Uh, the first um, point to make is that in the engineering side of performance management, we have to use statistical terms to define that distribution for us effectively. Whether you're in a performance-based contract mode or whether you're just in a monitoring mode wanting to know how your network changes over time. When we communicate this condition to the public in a level of service discussion, um, they won't understand what a 75th percentile or things like IRI is. So we normally use exception reporting, saying to the public that 95% um, of my roads is in a smooth category. I think in terms of communicating with the public, that's simple enough. There's two units of measures that our average Joe public understands well. The one is percentage and the other one is money. So whatever you try and communicate with them, remember those two units of measures. Then getting to the intervention or trigger levels, I may have some things such as roughness or whatever that increases over time as my asset ages. And then at some stage in that asset life, I need to start thinking about doing um, rehabilitation or resurfacing or whatever. If I don't and it deteriorates a bit further, then obviously I'm starting to consider more reconstruction or heavy rehabilitation at a later stage. Now the point at which you make a decision of when to intervene is your trigger level or your um, performance intervention level. Please note that whenever we refer to this area, we would normally talk about a particular road section or a very specific class of road with a specific traffic volume. Whenever we go to the wider distribution, we tend to be network focus or part of the network or a lump of roads out of my network that we're reporting on. Um, when we go to the doctor and you don't feel that well, um, I think with the GPs that we have today, it's, it's quite easy sometimes for them to diagnose um, your illness but I think it will also be very unprofessional of them if you come into the, into the, the uh, his, his offices and he looks at you and he says, oh, the pink pill for you today. I think there's a general expectation that when we go to the doctor, they're going to listen at your heart, take your temperature and do a lot of indicated tests and then start to 
from the story you tell them formulate your illness. The same with roads um, or with any infrastructure is we've got to look at all perspectives of the infrastructure in order to have a complete picture of how it is um, moving over time. The first one that we all use, and it's quite accustomed to the physical science, um, roughness, rutting, structural indexes, whatever you want to use. Then we get to the costing side, which we often also report. Um, but I find, in, in, in especially in the transportation side of things, um, we don't always have good confidence around our cost data. And that is actually something that we should be ashamed of because we are managing billions and billions and billion dollars of infrastructure and we don't always know what it costs us um, to maintain that. So I'm always, and I think we're all guilty, but our aim should be really in to improve the costing data. If you talk to the industry, the manufacturing industry, they would most of the times be able to tell a big piece of the equipment or the plant to the day and to the hour when they're going to replace it because they monitor the cost that goes into that piece of kit very accurately and they know when it's not cost effective to keep it running anymore but to bring in the new one. I think we should be the same with our roads and bridges and whatever we have in our road corridor. The other trend that I've been observing in our field is that there's an increased need to understand the risk or the vulnerabilities on our network. Um, with MAP21, um, there's a huge emphasis on talking about the risk as part of the asset management uh, process. And, and this is the area where we need more research and more learning. I'm going to show you some examples later on today where we've started looking at that in New Zealand. As a side note, when we've looked at networks or roads on our networks that failed catastrophically or had a rapid deterioration, only 30% of those had an early signal of physical signs before they started blowing out. Right, so we need to know what the vulnerabilities on our networks are. Um, just going through all the data items, I'm not going to spend too much time here. I think that you're all familiar uh, with most of these, my inventory side of things, the pavement condition and structures on the roads and bridge side, also what those structures consist of and the condition. The use of my network in terms of traffic volume and loading, I think we're doing pretty all right with that first half of our data items. However, with this bottom half, of often we are struggling a little bit. And uh, I would actually encourage you, I know that engineers are not that fond of statisticians, and they, nor are they that fond of um, the accountants in the organizations, right? Uh, that's not too wild of a statement, but I really encourage you to start getting a bit more accounting involvement in this part of the work that we do. Um, right, now starting off with the data, one of the first hurdles that you've got to overcome, I guess, is in how you define your network. Um, this is a World Bank um, representation of the different ways of segmenting a road network. We've got our routes. We may have links within the route. And then what we often use for maintenance management would be segments of a road of varying length. And then we've got the um, reporting and measurement links when we do data collection, whether it's visual assessment or um, automated data collection. They all have a measurement and a reporting length. One thing that we are very fortunate in New Zealand with, especially for the state highways, is we have kept data at a very low resolution. Um, the HSD equipment, the high speed data equipment, measure every three, three meters, do a measurement. Um, those measurements are then summarized to 20 meter lengths, 
And in the conditioned database in New Zealand, we've got 20 meter condition lengths. Um, we normally report that up at one level into segments when we do pavement management and that sort of thing. But with performance management, we really got to look at something in between those two levels. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. I have had a look around at some practices in your part of the world and down in New Zealand. Um, when we look at pavement management systems in particular, it is quite common to use homogeneous treatment links. And I think we're all comfortable with that. My question is always how homogeneous are your sections really? And, and, and well, that's one aspect in New Zealand we struggle with quite a bit. Um, if you look at literature in the um, Federal Highway Administration documentation, they would advise you to look at about a half, half a kilometre to up to 15 kilometres in road section length. In New Zealand, typically you would find our treatment links between 800 metres to two and a half um, kilometres. Um, we have recently completed a, an analysis on the entire state highway network, which is about 13,000 lane kilometres of road. And we've compared an analysis where we've used a 600 metre maximum length versus the sections they normally use. And there was about a 10% difference in every year's program just because of that. Now you can think for yourself, if you've got a kilometre length of road, but when you do contracts and you never do a kilometre of rehabilitation, then obviously your lengths are too long. And you have to trim it down to homogeneous section length. So when we talk about these treatment lengths, it should really be that length of when you do your next treatment will cover that entire length. So um, you can figure out for yourself what that ideal length is. When you go into the performance monitoring area, you need a little bit of more statistical resolution. So typically we would be looking at fixed lengths either between 100 meters to about 500 meters. Um, I have looked at uh, some documentation, I think this one was done by um, Linda Pierce and, and, and Katie Zimmerman, where they've advised at 100 meter fixed length if you want to do performance monitoring. Um, in New Zealand we use 200 meter fixed lengths, um, so the entire network is uh, summarised from, from that sort of level of data and, and it does make a huge difference in terms of the outcome. When you're in performance-based contracts, the World Bank would advise you to use 500 meter lengths, and I think that is quite appropriate. Um, in New Zealand, we use the old treatment lengths that we have, but often we would have acceptance criteria that refers to 50 meter lengths. So they would say your 75th percentile rough or rutting um, must be lower than say 11, um, millimeters and you are not allowed to have more than three 50 meter sections with a rutting more than 15 or 20 millimeters whatever that may be okay so it is quite quite a bit of detail they go into sectioning methods this is just an example that I've used for the commutative sum uh, method which is to my mind the easiest and the most effective one to use there who's the golfers in this room the golfers will know this. This is basically how you keep a golf score. Uh, you look at the average of your section, and then for each point you see if you're below or above the average. And you cumulatively um, just add those together. And what you will see that with this graph, either so the red line and the blue line is, is opposite sides of the same road. And every time that you get a shift in angle, you know the condition changes. So we've got something here that consistently performed better than the average and then suddenly it dipped. So at that point I will have a section break. So this purple blocks represents the section links that I've defined from this. The green line, the pavement section. So we've got a different pavement section there and there to the rest of the road network. Interesting enough, can you see the correlation between the two lanes? Perfect mirror image of each other. So uh, I think quite effective uh, illustration of how this works. If you do auto segmentation on your network as a reporting tool, you've really got to revisit your defined section lengths on at least a biannually basis because that 
does change quite significantly also from one year to another. Um, confidence rating system, um, and again, the um, Pierce and Zimmerman report had something similar in that. So this is what we've uh, developed for New Zealand. So we talk about equipment sophistication, um, calibration standard, quality assurance during surveys, and whatever criteria you want to use that. And then I've added one that I haven't seen in too many documentation, and that's a post-survey confirmation. Um, so what I encourage um, the service or the owners, asset owners in New Zealand to do is, is for a survey contractor to present the data outcome in comparison to the year before. Because often you get the data, you do the report, there's a bias in the data, you don't have a clue of what's going on. But if you make that the responsibility of the contractor to explain the difference, then suddenly things change quite quickly. And believe me, it works. In terms of good specification guidelines, I can advise you to have a look for the uh, FHWA uh, document, Hi Highway Performance Monitoring System Field Manual. That's a brilliant data specification manual. And then we've got the equivalent from Australia. Um, I encourage you to go and have a look at this uh, specification. It's the entire specification is digital data specification. And they've got an R spec, which is the roads, a B spec, which is the bridges, and so forth. So quite a good data specification series um, that you can look at also. Right. Now, stepping away from the data, we will start looking at how to link your performance framework, these last two columns, with the objectives and the goals of the agency you work for. And um, there's no rocket science in this, and I won't claim any rocket science. All I'm trying to say with this chart is whenever you've got a goal or a vision statement or whatever, you've got to make sure that you've got measures that sufficiently describe your performance in the relations to that goals and objectives. Because hopefully the entire agency would work towards achieving a certain outcome that the powers to be want to see out of a network. The moment you start monitoring and reporting outcomes in relation to those objectives, people start paying attention to it. And therefore there starts an automatic, uh, automatic self-improvement process um, in relation to that uh, measures that you define. Um, I've made a, a very important statement just now is the moment you start measuring and reporting things, people start taking notice of it. Okay, and that is a good thing, but it could also be quite a dangerous thing. Okay, so just keep that in mind, it cuts both ways. Um, in, in this instance, just as an example, so we've got our um, New Zealand Transport Agency that had certain vision statements which were lined up with the Ministry of Transportation targets and then from that we just started populating all the key performance measures that relates to whatever target we are talking about. Okay, so obviously if you want to improve safety on your network you've got to start looking at recording crashes and recording skid resistance and those sort of aspects in order to tell the story behind each of these objectives. Uh, the next point, and I apologize, this color doesn't work so well with the projector. Um, we have got a reporting in hierarchy or the implementation even in a payment management system where we use different performance measures at different levels. I think this part of the world is quite um, keen on the composite indexes, and so am I. Um, but there is a problem if you use it too low down the chain. Um, I'm a strong believer that you should use um, specific measures like roughness and rutting, things that you can directly measure at a lower level. And the higher up you step into an organization, you start talking more broader and wider in your communication techniques. Stepping on to the S word, and again, don't be switched off, please. Just give me a moment. <laughs> We've done a, a review of a network, and I'll, I'll come back to this network. This was uh, about 
five, six years before um, the work was, was done. When we started looking at it, the situation was that the contractor felt they were achieving the, the KPIs on their performance-based um, contract um, uh, well enough that they can start reducing their uh, rehabilitation quantities that they've signaled in the tender, but they were not contractually bound to do. So I was asked to review the network. Here is a plot of, what is this, roughness or rutting? Um, this one is the rutting measure. And what we have is the mean or the average, the swear word, and we can see that was relatively flat. We've got the exceptions here um, above a certain high roughness value and also percentage exceeded above um, another roughness value. So these two lines refer to the tail end. And then we've got this sharp increase on the moat. So if you ponder just on that information for a moment and you try and relate it to the lock normal distribution, that's a pink line, it was quite clear what the contractor was doing. They have improved or kept the average rutting or roughness quite effectively where they wanted it to be by hitting those worst first sections first, right? What has happened in reality is the bulk of the network deteriorated and the client didn't want that. So we're going to look later today at the same network when the client now after learning this lesson brushed up their performance measure definitions and then they started getting the desired outcome. So um, I think in your mind if you can always just remember this picture of a network now in blue and then the red dotted line of how it's going to look into the future. There's a few things that happens here. We get the tail end, the worst end of the network that kicks out and that deteriorates quite fast. And then we've got the entire network that is shifting. Now when we do rehabilitation or renewal work, we take some of these sections and we pump them back into the good part um, of the distribution, right? So you've got to really think of A, how do you want that distribution to look like in the future? And then once you know that statistically, how can you quantify your desired shift with that, um, with that distribution? Just a little bit of a legend to help us with, with slides to come is I've got a box and whisker plot just in on its uh, flat here. What we have is 75th percentile of my data would be in the boxes and then 95 in the whisker tail ends. Okay, so just remember how this box and whisker relates to the distribution picture. So this is the first one, NZTA called us in and um, we did performance monitoring of the average and they had a complaint from the public that said the roughness and the rutting are increasing and when they looked at their results, they didn't feel it did. What we knew was there was a jump in the condition between two years when a new laser configuration was used on the network, so we were able to, dis to explain that average jump. Um, but then the rest of the network increased by 0.4 millimeter over three years. Now that's nothing, right? 0.4 millimeters is nothing. Yet they couldn't understand why the public started noticing stuff until we brought in the entire distribution through these box and whisker charts and there you can clearly see what's happening. The entire network was shifting and especially your, your uh, extreme parts of the network was shifting quite a bit. When we presented this information to the agency, they had a counter um, policy and strategy implemented and they got on top of the problem um, rather quickly. Um, another tip when you report ages, especially ages of surfaces. Don't just report the current surface age of the network to give you an indication of how good your state of surfaces is. Use the recognized statistical uh, survival probability because that gives you an indication of the surfaces that you've used in the past that's now resurfaced as well as the surfaces that's still alive. If you look at just past surfaces, you're going to be biased towards the earlier failure. 
And if you look at the current age of your network, you're going to be biased towards the overperformers of the network. So you need to balance between the two. Use the survival statistics, and it's not that complicated. It's a standard feature in most applications. The reporting of cost and maintenance efficiency often is quite a complicated thing. Um, but I think in payment management systems in particular, we are quite used to these efficiency graphs. We've used in New Zealand the same principle of plotting different agencies, their annual expenditure on their network, and then in terms of whatever condition parameter we reported against where they fell um, on that chart. Now our best performance would be in this corner where you've got a small expenditure against a very good outcome. And these guys really got to brush up their act because they're spending heaps of money on their network and don't achieve much, right? So very effective, these efficiency um, plots. Uh, also, when you do reporting, um, we often get either an engineering report or a public consultation report. And those two are not necessarily telling you the same story. Uh, this is in a benchmarking of public transport. Uh, where we have looked at a few cities in New Zealand and we were concerned about the, um, how important the personal security was. So we've used two measures. The first one was a, a real measure of crime on the public transport system and then the bars represent um, the perceived safety from the passengers. And you see that it correlates in most cases. There was one city and incidentally this was Christchurch where obviously uh, the people f felt quite safe, but yeah, it was a little bit dangerous to travel in, in, uh, in Christchurch. Um, the same in using normalization to, to be able to compare apples with apples. Uh, what we're looking here is uh, benchmarking again in a public transport for developing countries. So this was a project for the World Bank. Uh, we, if you look at average bus fares, the bus, you would think that, okay, China and, and Sri Lanka is, is really cheap to be on the PT system. But if you start normalizing that same data per income, you get a different picture where really it is quite expensive in Colombo on the PT system in relation to what this average salary would be. Um, China, extremely um, cheap to be on the uh, public transportation system. I just have to note that God must be the highest um, subsidy on public transportation in the world. So no wonder that's so low. Where you can see New Zealand, it's very expensive. If you find PT, um, it's quite expensive then to get onto. So not a very effective. There's, there's a Canadian one, Vancouver. Um, a bit of a more balanced uh, figure, I guess. Right, getting on to what this all means. Now, these pictures actually do relate to the title. <laughs> um, these came out of South Africa where the public um, is really pushing very hard for government um, investment into the roads um, of South Africa. There's really roads that is in a shocking state. And one of the treatments they are using quite commonly is reverting back from sealed to unsealed. Um, so these photos actually came out of the media where people lobbied for more money. So this is a way of performance reporting and I think it's quite effective uh, if you, if you uh, would agree with me. So um, just getting back to this one, uh, when we've completed our performance uh, research for the NZTA, they said right now, show me the evidence, show that this works and they gave us four networks before and they didn't tell us which networks it were. We then ran our performance framework over the networks and we were able to write a story on each one of those networks. Then the outputs and the story went to the network manager and they then did a critique of the story that we inferred just from the raw data. So I haven't been through such a severe test as this one, believe me. So two networks that I will be presenting is first of all PSMC 006 or the Waikato region. You will remember slide one of the Hobbit that's running. That's in the Waikato area. So 
uh, mostly rural roads. Um, the highest milk producing part in New Zealand is in the Waikato, so it's green, there's a lot of grass, um, a lot of thin flexible pavement with chip seals, poor shop grade condition, mostly as a, res a result of the world's second largest volcanic eruption that formed what is now called the Taupo Lake. Um, but most of the Taupo, what is Taupo Lake's material is in the Waikato, and that's what they farm on. In Monaco City, where I live, uh, mostly an urban area to the south of uh, Auckland, uh, flexible pavement surface with both chip seals and asphalt. It's a rural area and an urban area that's not too dissimilar from this part of the world, uh, Waterloo and Kitchener. Uh, variable in subgrade conditions, so there's, there's quite a bit of different behaviour coming out of that network. So, um, starting off with the surface condition, we've got a composite index, a surface condition index, which is not too dissimilar to the uh, RDI, I think, uh, that you use in this part of the world. Only difference is our scale goes in the opposite direction. So if it's zero, it's a perfect surface. Up to 100 is a shocking surface. And let's look at the two networks. First of all, the PSMC State Highway Network. And we can see that they have um, improved the su surface condition on that road network significantly. Um, incidentally, these two years were the first two years of the PSMC contract. And obviously the financial model that the contractor had was to knock everything hard in the beginning and then sit back and waiting for the funds to come in. The uh, Monaco network, you can see also they've done a good job um, of the surfacing condition. It came down nicely and then it increases again uh, towards the latter part of the period that goes up to 2010. Um, structural indices, just to explain that quickly, we've taken the concept of the World Bank, the uh, structural index, um, but instead of using one index to describe the strength of the pavement, we have related the index uh, back to the fundamental pavement failure mechanisms. So we've got a structural index for rutting, which refers to your strains on the subgrade, We've got a structural index for roughness, which is basically the same as a rutting one, but it looks at the variation in that subgrade strain over your uh, length of road. We've got a structural index for flexure or cracking, so it relates to the stiffness of your upper layers in relation to the support it has. And then a, a shear index, which gives you an indication of the shear properties of your base course. So what we expect to come out of that shear one is typically your slip failures or your potholes. Uh, looking at the two networks, first of all the state highway network, a fairly balanced structural index um, distribution. Uh, we can see that it's a fairly consistent network if you look at the structural index for roughness. Um, but none of these indices is causing any concern. Um, if you compare it to the other networks, though, you can see that the routing index is maybe something to keep an eye on on that network. Historically, that network had a huge routing problem, so that then um, explains uh, the routing issue in that network. In the Monaco network, the urban network, the variable subgrade come through very nicely there, and also, as you know, your uh, layer work on an urban network is quite uh, variable due to trenching and other services and all of those things. So, uh, again, uh, quite expected results. However, none of those indices uh, would be causing me any concern just by looking at it. So let's look at the pavement performance. And we have done a few. I'm just showing you the, the rutting. Um, what we have done was to normalize rutting, not looking only at the absolute rut depth. So we don't say a pavement's got eight millimeters of uh, rutting. We look at both the absolute rutting and how it changes from one year to another. Because if you think about it, I can have a pavement with, say, 12 millimeters of rutting that don't change over time. And I can have the road just next door with eight millimeters of rutting, but it's changing at one millimeter per year. Which one would you be most concerned of? 
the one with 8 millimeter rotting, right? So what we've done is we um, did a composite index out of the change in the rutting and the absolute rutting came up with a rutting index. So if it's 100, there's no rutting or no rutting change at all. And um, these two charts shows the outcome of, of, of the rutting index. Starting off with the state highway, the PSMC network, and just note that these data only go to 2010, so we've got the data going a bit forward. Um, these two plots came from the contractor. So they've got the 90th percentile and the median of the rutting indicated within the um, contract standards, also indicated on those graphs. Not much. Um, I can see that at some stage they must have done something to rutting and it looks like uh, the rutting is improving on the network slightly. Looking at our data and what we inferred from it, um, ignore that one for the time being, but it looks like the rutting has increased, but it's certainly in the later part of the analysis starting to, uh, to, to, to look a little bit better. But there was something that um, went wrong in 2008, and that's definitely an anomaly in the data collection itself. Um, looking at the rural network, pretty flat, um, maybe a slight increase in the rutting in the later years, which is um, also mirrored by the rutting index, but I would say that increase is not true. Again, that's an anomaly that came out. Interesting with this project, we had of the five years investigation on four networks, we had a year or two on each network where there was a bias in the HSD data. And we could only explain it when we started looking at our indices opposed to the traditional way of uh, reporting the data. Because if you see a blip like that, what does it mean? You're there now, you go, is it deteriorating? Is that a reduction or is that an increase? What's, what's happening here? And in fact, that may have been the year of the bias in the data, and you didn't know of it. So um, nothing in terms of the network story that came out here, other than pointing out those anomalies. Looking at the roughness, um, we've got two indices here, a normalized vehicle operating costs and the um, roughness itself. And what we can see on that PSMC network, yes, we can see they've done some works in 2008, and as a result, also a, a bit of a reduction in the cost um, driving on that network. The Monaco network, uh, we can see that the cost increased, but it certainly stabilized towards the end of the analysis period. So things are looking better on the Monaco network in terms of the pavement behavior. Um, then we have developed, um, and this came out of one of my first PhD students, she graduated last year. She has developed a risk index of pavement failure, and um, she heavily rely on the structural index definition, this information, and came up with a failure index for the four main failure groups. Um, cracking, rutting, shear, and then an overall failure, um, failure risk. On this side, you're talking about your safe roads, so you won't be worried about those spikes. On that end of each one of these scales would be your more vulnerable roads. Um, this was on thin, flexible rural roads only, so we didn't, uh, haven't done the development for asphalt um, surfaces yet. So that's why we don't repeat the plot. In terms of just looking at this, the only thing I can see here on that Waikato network, there's a slight increase in a risk towards rutting. And we were expecting that result. We know the subgrade condition. We know the pavements. So even though the physical conditions looks OK, there's still that inherent risk of uh, rapid failure on that network in a, in a subgrade failure mode. So that was the data then coming to the story for the PSMC network. In the past few years, the surface condition has improved. The pavement condition has improved. But uh, be careful to reduce the rehabilitation quantities 
because that inherent risk of the uh, rutting failure is still present and must be controlled. Also the anomaly in the 2008 data. So overall, a well-maintained network, a very balanced maintenance program. Um, the contractor was delighted about this outcome, obviously. Um, but they actually contributed a bit more data that, that substantiated the story. Monaco, the same surface conditions, slightly deteriorating, obviously over the past years, and we did confirm that um, through the data that was sent to us afterwards. They have switched a little bit of money from the surfaces into pavement works, and that outcome has started to show. By the way, with this performance work, I have noticed um, when you do a shift in investment profile, you can expect a, 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 re a delayed response for your pavement condition of about between two to three years. So you're going to shift your money. You're not immediately going to see the impact on your condition profiles. That will kick in only later in about two or three years' time. Um, for the Monaco network, structural indices uh, shows that this network may be prone to roughness. Obviously, that was quite a, uh, an obvious um, thing that came out of the strength indices, and then also the anomaly in 2010. The client was not aware of that one, so when we, our information went to them for a peer review, they came back to us and said, thank you very much. We were wondering what was going on over that year. Anyway, well-maintained network um, surfacing may become an issue in the future, sort of the end of, of, of that network. So um, as an executive manager, I think you would agree this is a sort of level of information or a story that you need out of a network, whether you're heading down the right investment path or not. Okay, so finally, some of the findings and the recommendations um, data issues and availability. Um, you've got to pay attention to the appropriate granularity or the resolution of your data. It is important. Um, the value of your information you provide is a direct function of your data quality, obviously. Um, I don't necessarily advocate that we've got to have perfect data in all cases. I think you need to use um, a bit of common sense and understanding of risk. So for the important things, yes, try and get the best data out. And for the less important things, you can maybe stick to your current practices. But what I would encourage you to do is start developing a sense of the um, confidence levels around your data items. So that you can say, for this item, I know everything, it's exact, trust that value. For this item, don't trust the value, it's maybe plus or minus 20%. So start developing the um, understanding of that uncertainty. Have a plan to improve. Um, that's an obvious item that comes out of performance management. Value of KPIs, increase if you directly link it to the objectives. I think I've said enough there. You've got to consider normalization. It's important in the story you want to tell. Um, contextual data is also quite important with, um, especially when you do benchmarking between two networks, you've got to explain the differences before you start comparing the out outcomes one to one. Um, you always need the motivation and the buy-in from the top. Um, unfortunately, this is one of those <laughs> initiatives that you often say, mm, why did I start this? Because there's in most cases, cost implications once you start doing this um, in terms of getting more data in or better data in or change the database structure or something like that. But in the end, it's all worthwhile. Um, but to make it work, you need that uh, executive management support. And ultimately, the framework that you use is key in, in just being effective to tell a story on, on a particular network. So that is my message today. I welcome any questions. What we're going to do is we're going to pass the microphone around. Um, so Marcelo has kindly agreed to um, do that. If you have a question, can you please state your name 
and your organization so we, um, we know who you are. So thank you. So do we have any questions? Thanks, Chins. Uh, Gary Ruck from Tetra Tech. We're a consulting company that does uh, management system implementations. My question comes back to when you were talking about uh, segmentation. And what would your comments be about when you want to include budgetary restrictions in developing segments? Because what we found is that the length of a section if it gets too long and you're trying to do a management program on it, sometimes the work, the cost of work, doing work on those very long sections could be greater than an agency's budget. And it varies depending on how much money you have. If I've only got X million dollars or thousand dollars to spend per year, my section length may not be able to be very long because the cost of doing work is already over the budget that I have available. And that's something that we I really think that, struggle that a lot. That question nails that issue on the head, um, because that was exactly what we found with the NZTA analysis. Um, we had section length in the axis of two kilometers, and the maintenance philosophy in New Zealand is we only fix the part that's broken. So they hardly ever do any rehabilitation project longer than 600 meters, and we said, well, then it's senseless to run the analysis on your two kilometer sections. So we broke the network down to 500 meter sections and got a far better result as a result of it, you know. So it's essential, your section length must reflect your length of um, maintenance work. Thank you. Somebody had a talk um, Li Yuan, Ontario Ministry of Transportation. Um, good presentation, <laughs> thank you. The, uh, uh, this is an ongoing uh, working assignment at the ministry, um, rescaling the performance index. Uh, one of the performance in, uh, indices is riding performance, right? The, the real ro ro the raw riding measurement is uh, the millimeters, right? Now we're gonna scale it from like, for example, from zero to 10 or zero to 100, as you present like percentage of uh, P50 or P70 here. So, and uh, to do that, involve in some data, uh, data analysis, data future things. Simple question is, uh, in your analysis on New Zealand, what would be the maximum the, uh, the rod in depth. Good. Um, I think that's a very interesting approach and it is 100% valid to do that. So what was explained when you report on something like rutting, you're not gonna report on the exact rutting, you're gonna bin all the data into intervals of say five millimeters. So you're gonna have percentage of my network, zero to five, percentage five to 10, 10 to 15 and 15 to 20. That's more or less how you do it. And I think that's an absolute valid approach. My comment on the section length still stands because if you have got a section length of uh, 40 kilometers long and the rutting is say eight millimeters, but it varies like this, it's not a valid eight millimeters. So just watch your section length. Your approach is 100% is, is correct. We're gonna have extreme rutting values in New Zealand that goes above 25 millimeters, which is in our case uh, extreme. Um, and that would be because we've got granular base courses. This is not for an asphalt um, base or an asphalt pavement uh, because the mechanism is completely different with the asphalt. It's more of a, a consolidation aspect than really a subgrade failing issue. So in New Zealand, we, we do watch rutting because A, it's, it's a safety hazard aspect that we want to keep in, in check, but it's also a pavement failure issue. Um, our extreme values would be anything above 25 millimeters, and we would normally address those with routine maintenance, uh, but 25 is sort of the maximum value. We tend to be aware of rutting anything above 15 millimeters. 
But again, that's applicable to that type of pavements that you would get into the north of Canada, <coughs> not on asphalt pavements. Good. Thank you. Second question. <laughs> Second question. Okay. Second question, they uh, continue on the riding, right? The, uh, the riding, uh, we, we also did um, like a 10 years riding um, analysis of trying to uh, scale, to, to make like a like an MTU standard performance uh, riding index. So we, we try to use like a 30 millimeters as maximum. Any, any riding uh, like uh, larger than 30 would be considered as uh, 30. Or com compared to yeah. 20 or 25 on series analysis, we did that. Well, in, in that case, we had a bit of a problem um, because authorities see routing quite differently. Uh, for some, up to 30 meters, 30 millimeters is okay. On the state highways, that would not be okay. And that's one of the reasons why we went to a rut index. So we got rid of all the arguments and the discussions around what the maximum should be for the normalization. What we do is we define a rut index per network. So the normalization is for the maximum rut value on that particular network will be the bottom end of the index. And then we normalize everything else in between. And that same principle applies for the rut change in here. Um, for the granular pavements, Anything between 1.5 to 2 millimeters rut chains per year indicates accelerated failure. Um, but on some networks, it may be more or less. And we even normalize that factor to the maximum observed on that particular network. Thank you. Thank you. Was there anything on the webinars that yep. came through? Okay. One, one more for you, Jens. Could Maybe if you could talk a little bit more about the risk index that you were showing at the end there. Because um, when I look at risk and how we use it, we're looking at probability, consequence, and maybe some redundancy. Is that built into that risk index as well? Because as you mentioned with MAP21, risk is becoming a really popular uh, variable or performance measure to include in, in your analyses. Okay. Um, I think we need to just take a step back so that fundamentally risk is your probability times the consequence. Um, what we have done and why we call it the risk index and not a probability index is we, we looked at that uh, probability of failure at a given traffic level and then what sort of failure consequence you're going to have. So um, that's why we've got the risk indices itself. Um, it was um, quite a tough uh, piece of work that we had to look at and in the end um, the PhD student who did this work, Megan, um, she used a statistical technique called support vector machines. So you physically train a mathematical model um, similar to the way that you do um, uh, neural networking. So you, you tell the model what were all the variables and what was the outcome. Then what it does, it creates a plane between the failure data and the non-failure data to, in order to then do a prediction on the network. So statistically wise, it is quite a complex process to develop. Once it's there though, it's quite simple to run on the network. You basically throw all your input parameters and it gives you a, a risk between zero and one. You know, so it is possible to do. For the sake of, uh... Okay, uh, thank you, Tens, uh, for the presentation, and I hope, uh, I hope other people ask questions. I see people thinking, so I'm giving you a buy here to ask questions. Um, so I am also a believer in the box and whisker plots because I think they really give you a good idea of the range. And um, can you perhaps, in your experience, and you know, having reviewed this report closely, um, can you talk a little bit about 
what are the advantages and disadvantages of using those and and perhaps as well comment a little bit on what do you do as an organization if you you know you're plotting these things and then all of a sudden you see a big a big yeah and usually what's happening is and i mean it ties back to the question we had earlier about risk but how do you manage that? What, what kind of advice can you give to people? Uh, that's two uh, rather loaded questions, but um, <laughs> I think it's, it's uh, very good. Um, as uh, some of you may know, there's uh, complete shifts in the procurement model for managing maintenance on state highways in New Zealand, which is something or a bit of a mix between the old traditional performance-based contracts, the contracts, maintenance contracts they're using in the UK. We've got quite a few UK engineers in New Zealand that's helping us, so that influence came through. Um, and part of the process uh, for our analysis was to try and understand what the absolute, absolute minimum of investment would be on a road network. And it was a tricky question. So we went um, and did a, a number of simulations and, and, and permutations to see exactly what happens to a network when you start reducing the funding significantly. There's um, two parts to that question. I think if you look at the individual section, it will deteriorate and deteriorate, but at some stage it would be in such a bad condition that you have to rebuild it or scrap the road. You need to think of a network condition a little bit differently. That's not what we aim for or a level of sustainability is on an on a, on a entire network. It's more like your bank balance, right? You can take on debt um, and be able to carry that debt, but there is a tipping point that if you go beyond that, if you loan too much money or if you borrow too much money, you go into a debt spiral and you're simply not able to pay off your debt and you go backwards with your bank balance. A similar thing happens on, on, on infrastructure networks or road networks. So what we had to look at was how do these distributions change over time and when do you reach that tipping point and now the network becomes unsustainable to manage, I won't be able to recover it back. Interesting enough, the one parameter that explains that position the best was the 75th percentile. Um, we saw the worst part of the network deteriorating, deteriorating, but the moment that my 75th percentile starts to move, you know you're in trouble. So hence another good reasons why you should be using um, the box and whisker chart. There's another reason. Um, Unfortunately, an evil in road maintenance, and especially the more experienced road engineers that make decisions in the field, tend to follow a worse first strategy. There's enough evidence and literature around the world to say that's about 15 to 20 percent uneconomical or non-optimal. And um, following your box and whisker charts, clearly shows which end of the network is being addressed. So if your bulk, your 75th percentile of the network is shifting, you are not doing sufficient proactive maintenance work. So um, these box and whisker charts and just looking at that one is uh, extremely useful. The problem comes when you see the spike. And as I said again, when you use the indices, the spike becomes more prominent. You can easily identify bias in the network. Um, and it's a very difficult thing to address. Um, I guess the most efficient, which will be the nastiest one to do, is ask the contractor to resurvey the entire network. Um, but often that's not even a solution. What we have started doing in New Zealand is we've got a number of LTPP sections or long-term pavement performance sections around the country which um, would be surveyed manually, so with a walking profile meter and those sort of things on an annual basis. So we trust the data on those sections. And then what we have done with a piece of research was to develop a methodology of comparing trends and things on the LTPP sites 
versus the network outcomes in order to make a reasonable shift if there was a bias. That was that the two questions? Yeah, that was good. And then I have another question that's come in here to clarify what the structural index um, related to flex is versus a structural index related to shear. What were you, can you define it and explain it? Uh, just getting to the structural indices quickly. Right. Um, so the question is the difference between the structural index for flex and the structural index for shear. Um, the flex one is really an indication of how much uh, bending takes place in my base course and also the stiffness of that base course. If I have a very stiff base course and there's quite a bit of deflection, it's going to crack. So we're going to see that in our flexure index. The um, shear index is um, much more related to the Poisson's ratio, so it's really a property of, of, of the shear properties of my base course. It's got a total different failure mechanism, so you're going to see potholes, and you're going to see um, edge drop-off, and you're going to see some shoves or, or, a, or a typical shear plane failure um, on the road itself. Um, there's uh, research report and literature um, from Grand Salt in, in New Zealand that published this piece of work, development work that he has done. So you can uh, see the fundamental principle behind the indices there. Any other questions? Uh, hello, my name is uh, Zay Daliami. I'm a PhD student here with Dr. Susan Tai. My question is uh, about the uh, risk index, and, and I'm trying to to think about how it's driven by your KPIs and your main, uh, minimum acceptable levels, and and the impact on that uh, failure or the probability of failure. And then the uh, the other one I had is. Um, was there any use, the reporting you, you're indicating really tells uh, a better story as you indicated about the performance. Have you uh, put any requirements on the contractors to report in that way when they report their, their, uh, in, their in their contracts? Okay, uh, two very good questions from the students here at Waterloo. <laughs> Um, right, the first one, uh, perhaps I should just tell you a little bit more about how the gravel roads or the gravel structures, pavement in New Zealand, uh, typically the failure that you see from them, is you're going to get a settling in phase, so there's going to be a bit of rutting that happens in the beginning when that layer is compact, and then that road is going to have a very similar performance over time. Something like roughness and rutting is basically going to be a flat line for a very long time. Uh, often we come back and just rejuvenate the surface, um, but when we don't do that or there's a sudden flood or a sudden overloading, that pavement fails very rapidly, right? So what we have tried to capture with the risk index is that point of inflection when you accelerate the rutting start. So we're not concerned about the line because once it fails that road is going to be gone in months right in two months or so so you've got to know in advance which roads are vulnerable by um, starting to develop the factors or to look at the factors that signal that kind of failure a little bit earlier on just helps our planning process and we didn't come up with target values or risk values where you should be thinking of rehabilitation, but in particular you may have two roads where one's got a bit of defects on it, but the risk on that road could be quite low, where the road next to it may look actually in a very good condition, but it's got a very high risk for rapid failure. Maybe the, the layers well was a bit on the thin side or something like that. So when you make a maintenance decisions, you can make a much more informed decision by adding the risk elements to the just looking at the condition. 
What we have seen with some networks, some networks um, managers over the years has gone into very intensive resurfacing programs. So they've done a lot of resurfacing and not so much rehabilitation. And for a while, their networks looked quite good, but the occurrences of catastrophic or rapid failures just increased rapidly, right? So it signaled that the vulnerability of that network has increased. So with a little bit of high rainfall, with a bit of more traffic, the roads blow out quite quickly. So that's the sort of uh, behavior that we tried to catch early. Um, your second question. Uh, reporting oh, reporting requirements. So we don't have um, specific reporting requirements as uh, per se, but typically what we say to the contractor that um, if a condition item such as, as, as rutting varies more than a certain percentage with a certain confidence limit, they must explain where it comes from and also have similar criteria on individual road lengths. Um, it created, well, two things. First of all, the contractors quickly realized how much risk it put back on them. So they've done processing at night to see if the surveys they've done the previous day was sufficient. And if it passed the test, they go on to the next one. Otherwise, they just repeat one day survey. So there was a self-checking mechanism. The second thing that came out is suddenly there's roads that had a condition shift, and it may be the road is now suddenly in a much better condition. Nowhere on the database there was any maintenance records. So these um, contractors then start coming back and say, you don't have the maintenance record, but this road was actually rehabilitated last year. So suddenly there was another check on the data to ensure that the database quality has uh, improved. Do we have any other questions? Burning questions? Interesting presentation. Uh, I'm uh, Mohabal Hakim from uh, Stanton Consulting. Uh, just uh, going back to the indices uh, about uh, that you have presented the uh, rutting index and the uh, flex shear and uh, roughness one. Just wondering, in case uh, due to limited budgeting, uh, a municipality would not be able to keep uh, data collection for one of those. Uh, indices, uh, would you be able to make that up by uh, relations between those indices, historical relation from previous uh, years? Okay. That is an excellent question and it, it goes a little beyond that. When we've developed the performance framework, um, the intent of um, NZTA, the funder, was to do performance monitoring on all, all local authorities um, to see if the investment into those authorities are appropriate or not. The problem is none of these authorities uses the same data collection regime. So one of the outcomes of this project was to, to specify exactly what they should do. And the moment you go into performance monitoring, there are a certain number of things that must happen. For example, if you do sampling, so you measure only a certain portions, your sample every year has got to be in the same place. Otherwise, there's no trends that you can monitor, you know, things like that. So what we have come up with was a significant demand for data collection for all the authorities in New Zealand. That was simply unaffordable. So alongside that, we've come up with um, a risk thinking behind the criticality or the importance of the road hierarchy and then for the more important roads do more and um, for the less important roads do more but less often you understand so instead of doing every year a survey there with only roughness we say no we need rutting but then do it every second or every third year so there's there's ways of and we've implemented significant data improvement programs for many authorities that turned out to be cost neutral. 
but we've doubled the value of the data just by doing things a bit more smarter. So you don't always have to go more expensive. You can use some of these techniques to keep the cost intact also. Good question. Thanks, I enjoyed your presentations. And in your presentation, you emphasize the importance of uh, data quality. Can you share uh, us with your experience with the quality management for those, uh, you know, uh, pay, for example, uh, pay payment performance data collections? You know, uh, is there anything you do to, to uh, how to say, to help you get a better quality data? Uh, we notice, uh, <laughs> you know, because all the analysis is done, uh, done based on the data. So uh, what do you do to uh, ensure that you have uh, at least, you know, acceptable uh, data for your analysis? Right. So, so any project that I take on, rule number one is never trust the data. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, we, we think we've got good quality data, but the nature of these equipment and the processes involved and the persons involved leave quite a few points in time where there can be a little bit of a boo-boo happening. Um, I, I encourage you to look at Linda Pierce and, and Kate, Katie Zimmerman's book on, on data quality and how you can manage that better. I think they've got a few good points in. Um, my experience really is, is to put more ownership on the contractor themselves. So just by the fact of making the contractor responsible for reporting his survey to the survey year before is already a very good point. Because now suddenly they cannot explain certain things and, and, and therefore they will delve back in where, where the problems were with that particular data item or whatever the case may be. Um, so that, for me, is still one of the most effective. The other thing is to have um, uh, the, the, the calibration process at the onset and the end of a survey period is not enough. Um, because you may have specifications of, say, you need to have 15 measurements to this tolerance on a calibration site and then the contract can go and measure that site 700 times and give you the best 15. <laughs> Obviously, it's going to look okay. But in reality, the variation in their measurements doesn't tie up with that. So you've got to have sections located in your network that you know what's happening to them. And then uh, benchmark your network surveys to those known sections. And You've got a number of LTPP sections in this uh, province also. Yes. I mean, they've got good data on those sections, and that could be excellent benchmarking sections. So the contractor don't even have to know where they are. But you can afterwards trace them back to comparing the two surveys. Um, the biggest challenge with that is um, one of the main error in HSD measurements is the longitudinal referencing. So the measurement last year year is now suddenly half a kilometer down the street. Yeah. So you've got to find a way of um, rubber banding the surveys that they line up one year to another. Nice. OK, you're welcome. It's a clock, a <laughs> University of Waterloo clock. <laughs> Thank you So very you much. can put this on your desk. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And um, if anyone has uh, any other questions, um, we'll stick around a little bit after. And thank you so much for sharing your Thank you. I appreciate it.